When I first received the phone call, I thought it was some sort of prank. They said they were calling in regard to my apparent entering into a contest the local radio station was hosting. My mind went blank for several minutes, as I tried desperately to remember if I had entered in any contest. All I could muster was a deceptive, yeah, contest, of course. The host on the other end of the line didn't seem convinced. He went through the details of the contest for me. He said that it took place during October, and it was for an opportunity to be a part of a televised ghost hunt. During his explanation, I found myself racking my brain over and over, trying to think of when I called into a radio station. The guy gave me a date, time, and location. He congratulated me once more for winning and wished me luck. I sat there, staring at my phone in my hand, wondering what in the hell just happened. I knew for a fact I hadn't entered in any contest. I sat on my bed for nearly 10 minutes trying to think of how this happened. Then something crossed my mind. I turned on my phone and called my friend Mikey, it took me nearly three attempts to reach him. When he answered, he clearly wasn't in the right state of mind. He asked me who I was four times in a row, before it finally dawned on him who I was. Mikey and I go way back, and we hang out frequently. Mikey likes to partake in recreational smoking if you get my drift. Technically, we both do, but I only smoke when we hang out, and he, well... He smokes like it's a national sport. I finally got through to him and asked him if he had entered me in some radio contest. When I did, the line went silent for five solid minutes. Then, a deafening laughter erupted on the other end. I rubbed my eyes as I waited for his laughing to subside. He then reminded me that at the beginning of October, we were driving around listening to the radio. We had heard them speak about one lucky caller getting to win a thrill of a lifetime. Well, according to Mikey, after I dropped him off at his house, he called the radio station and entered my name and information as a joke. He asked me why I was asking about it and with a sigh I told him that I won. The laughter returned, even harder this time. Mikey then asked me if I was going to go, and I told him that I hadn't decided yet. He then started to go to me into it, and as much as I hated to admit it, it was kind of working on me. He said, how many chances do people get to do something like that? And honestly, I agreed. I hung up the phone, but not before telling Mikey he could go screw himself. I checked my calendar and was surprised that I actually had that coming weekend off. It was the first weekend of November this event was scheduled to happen. I searched the address and found that it was the location of a former sanitarium, about 40 miles outside of town. I chuckled at how on the nose this was. The weekend arrived and I drove out to the location. As I pulled in, I stared up at the imposing building. Discolored exterior walls and broken grimy windows gave the place a nice, disgusting feel to it. I parked my car and walked to the entrance. I was immediately accosted by a member of the crew. It was an older guy who seemed to dress like he was still in high school. Gray goatee with baggy pants and a black hoodie. He told me that this place was closed to visitors, but I explained that I had won a radio contest. When I said that, his face lit up and he let out a hearty laugh. He brought me over to the rest of the crew and we all shared our introductions. We spent the first hour signing paperwork, basically not holding the company or crew liable if something were to happen to me. The host, let's call him Will, gave me a rundown on what I should say and how I should act when the cameras are rolling. He said genuine reactions are alright, but that I should try to be a bit more enthusiastic than normal. For the audience. I nodded, not wanting to make a fool out of myself or insult any of the crew. Will then stopped me and asked if I believed in ghosts. I was honest, I told him I had never experienced one before, but that I was open to the possibility. He smiled and patted me on the shoulder. He then told me that he had seen hundreds of ghosts and to not worry about a thing. I returned a sideways glance, but nodded nonetheless. He then led me over and got me rigged up with a vest. 
handed me a few pieces of equipment, an EMF detector, a flashlight, and a night vision camera, as well as a small tape recorder. The sun was beginning to set as the cameras began rolling. Will jumped right into talking to the cameras. I could tell he had done this many times before. He then pointed over to me and introduced me as a special guest. I waved to the camera, gave Will a nod, and we all headed into the beast that was the sanitarium. Will's words, not mine. Upon entering, the smell of rotted wood and decades-old mildew filled my nostrils. We set up in the main lobby and we were each tasked with inspecting various rooms of the building. Will turned to me and told me that he and I would be inspecting the electrotherapy ward on the northern end of the building. We proceeded down the darkened hallways, our footfalls echoing off the stone walls. Will then turned to my camera and began describing what it was like being inside this place. As he spoke, I started to get the feeling like something was watching the two of us. Something just out of sight. Will froze and claimed he had heard footsteps as I glanced around. I hadn't heard anything, but that feeling of being watched hadn't gone away either. Will continued the charge down the hallway, asking questions to the empty air around us, until eventually, we arrived face to face to a large set of double wooden doors. We pushed the doors open which returned a sickening creak and entered the electrotherapy ward. The room was pretty much an empty shell aside from some light debris strewn about the floor. Will held his tape recorder aloft and asked if anyone was here with us. He walked around the darkened room, trying to gather some form of evidence. That's when I felt a dramatic drop in temperature. My breath nearly solidified before my eyes, and I turned to look at Will. A look of amazement crawled across his face. However, I wasn't sharing his enthusiasm. He began speaking into the camera, denoting all of the sudden activity we were receiving. That presence of eyes on me was far stronger in this room than the rest of the building, and I turned the camera aside and asked Will if we should return to the lobby, but he just shrugged me off. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something on the far side of the room. Someone was standing there, in the dark. I slowly turned my body and aimed my camera in that direction. Will noticed the sudden shift in my demeanor and attempted to assuage my fears. He turned to see what I was staring at and immediately collapsed back onto the ground, shrieking in terror. While Will screamed, I held my breath. I didn't want to make the slightest sound or movement, lest it draw this thing's attention towards me. It was an imposing figure, large with broad shoulders. It looked like a man but I could quickly tell it wasn't. He wore a knee-length lab coat, which had long since become a faded brown color. I could see through the camera a deeply unnerving sight. His face was partially obscured by a surgical mask, but the entire right half of his face was missing, like it had been methodically sheared away from his skull. His beady little eyes stared at both of us, not letting any subtle movement go unnoticed. Will scrambled across the ground to the doors, but they slammed shut in his face. Whatever it was that was standing in the corner began to jitter slightly before vanishing and reappearing in front of Will. It was like watching a piece of damaged film play out before my eyes. Will screamed so hard that his body eventually went limp and he collapsed onto the ground. My hands were trembling, shaking the camera so badly that I could hardly see anything through it. It vanished once more, and appeared in front of me this time. Its head kept twitching and moving in different directions, almost like it was reeling in pain. It raised one of its gloved hands and I noticed that it was grasping something I previously hadn't seen. It was a long, rusted scalpel. It brought the edge to the right side of my face, and I could sense the metal about to pierce my skin. With its left hand, it peeled away its surgical mask, and I saw a bloody mass of flesh and bone hanging from where its jaw should be. 
I could feel my heart beating so hard that I thought I was about to join Will in passing out. Then, the wooden double doors burst open behind me. The rest of the crew came rushing in. They asked me what happened and when I turned back, that figure was gone. They scooped up Will from the floor and we all quickly made our way outside of the sanitarium. They each looked at me expectantly, asking me all the details of the encounter, but I couldn't find my voice to speak. I told them if they want answers they should just watch the footage. But when they went to play it back, nearly all of it had become corrupted. The only parts unaffected were Will's narrative dialogue. Will finally regained consciousness shortly after, and demanded the crew pack up and head home. He seemed far more shaken than I would have imagined a professional ghost hunter to be. He apologized for the turn of events and thanked me for joining them. He bid me a safe journey home and returned to pack up their van. I've been sitting here for a few days now, trying to process all that has happened. I received a consolatory call from the network, but that did little to ease my nerves. They also informed me that due to the nature of the footage we captured, that the episode won't make it to air. I never used to consider myself a believer in the paranormal, but after what I had experienced with that ghost hunting crew, I can tell you for certain, there are things out there hiding in the dark places of the world and we should avoid looking for them at all cost.